Thanks, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. My task this morning is to talk a little bit about the Gospel of John. If you've been following in the Immersed series, you'll know that you've already been reading the Gospel of John. I'm going to try to introduce it to you now that you've read most of it. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's the way it works, and now my computer is... There we go. From its opening words, the Gospel of John has a very different, distinctive voice. Let's remind ourselves of these very famous opening words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John doesn't start the way Luke does with an old man in a temple, or as Mark does with John the Baptist in the desert, or even as Matthew does with the family tree of Jesus. He starts before time itself. He invites us to travel back in our minds, right back to the beginning. So try very hard now. In your mind, you got it? You're moving back through all the human history that you know about, and then all the prehistory, and you go back, and you go back, and you go back till before this planet was formed and go back as far as you can go. And if you go back as far as you can go, you'll discover that the Word was already there. That's where John begins. In the beginning was the Word, already was. What was this Word? It seems like a strange thing to say. Sounds very abstract and philosophical, but we discover then that in human language, the word is a person, a divine person in the beginning who is God and at the same time who is with God. And this word, well, we use words to explain, to express meaning. This word explains everything. He is the author of all things. He spoke them into being. Everything that was created was created through and by and with him. And in him, John says, is life. And that life is the light. Interesting ideas. We begin to think of what does that mean? Life and light. We speak about having light on a problem. I need some light on this. I don't understand it. Light on a mystery. And John is using it in that sense. The life in Christ is the light because to science, life is basically an impenetrable mystery. It does its best but falls so far short because it can't explain everything in terms of mechanisms and processes. We're invited by John just to look at life, whether it is the language of DNA or the vast complexities of the tiny garden birds I was attempting to photograph this week uh, in flight. There's a challenge for you if you're a photographer and realizing that the tiniest little goldfinch or wren is vastly more complex than the most sophisticated human flying machine. We're surrounded by life. We have life in ourselves. And when you see life, you ask questions. It's hot wired into us to ask questions. Where does it come from? Why is it here? And the answer, according to John, is in him. Life sheds its light so that it points us to the one who is the source of everything. 
It acts as a kind of signpost. It's meant to. Wherever you look, this week I had fun. Last night I was out trying to photograph the stars uh, outside our door, just looking up at a, well, almost clear night. It wasn't entirely clear. The previous night I was photographing the sun as it sat behind a bush. Exciting things that I get up to in my old age. Just surrounded by life and signposts that are pointing somewhere, that raise questions. And the ultimate answer to these questions lies not in darkness, but in a person who is the Word, who is God, and who was with God. But this word has gone further in his communication, according to John. And as you read through this magnificent first chapter of John, this uncreated word who was God and was with God took on a human body, the creator entering his creation, real flesh and blood, humanity, God communicating himself to us up close and personal, and we saw him, John says. We personally saw him. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Not simply that he is gracious and truthful, but he embodies grace and truth. He fully communicates what God the Father is like. And John reminds us that on a previous occasion, God had communicated himself in a variety of ways, particularly through Moses, because the law, he tells us, was given through Moses. And what a huge moment in history that was. God not only revealing his character to us, but doing it in such a way that exposed our own character to us. And how far short we fall of his and how much we need him and we need the salvation that he has for us to see our need of God's mercy. But notice the contrast. The law, says John, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. A contrast in verbs. The law was given through Moses. He was the messenger. He brought the message faithfully. But Jesus is the message. And a contrast in content. The law given through Moses. Grace and the fullness of God's truth coming in this word that we now know the word become flesh who is Jesus. And what is meant by grace? And here John borrows the introduction that John the Baptist used when he was introducing this word to the world, this Jesus of Nazareth. He said, look, this is God's lamb. Takes away the sin of the world. Oh, he did so many magnificent things. His focus on the poor, his feeding the hungry, his healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. But John mentions none of that here. He goes to the essential thing. Why did this word become flesh? To become the Lamb of God. To deal with not the individual sins, but the sin of the world, the whole issue of sin. This is John's introduction. And then he gives us a number of different characters who encountered Jesus, but they're not a random collection because each one of them represents a much bigger theme. For example, Simon, that Interesting story. You're Simon. You will become Peter, a living stone. The impact of the coming of the Word of God is to turn people into living stones built up in a spiritual building, as Peter himself will go on to write about. 
And this introduction climaxes in chapter two with the famous story of the marriage at Cana. John includes it, nobody else does. Why does John include it? Well, one, because it happened, of course, but secondly, because in his sweep of history and his presentation of this one, he wants our eyes to finish in the future because eternity itself is going to begin with a whole new relationship between God and his people and will start with the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's it's mind-boggling. All of us can gain something from it, but even the most intelligent of us still is grasping and struggling to get our minds around this vast vision that John presents us in his gospel. At whatever age you read it, whether it's 16 or 69, it's just deeper than we are. But after this, then, John organizes his gospel around a series of journeys. You may have noticed the references from chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. And then at the end of chapter, or in chapter four, he heads north again. And then chapter five, he heads up to Jerusalem. And then at the end of six, he's back north. And chapter seven, he goes up to Jerusalem and then back. That's the way John structures his gospel. And each of these journeys is set against major Jewish festivals, especially the Passover. And so if you're going to continue thinking about John, you might like to look at that. The references to Passover and Jesus showing himself to be this Lamb of God, the fulfillment of Passover and the lessons God was teaching his people. And dotted throughout these journeys, there are a number of miracles. Many of them are unique to John, you might have found as you were reading through and you read about Cana and you say, well, Luke didn't talk about this and neither does Matthew. And then you read another one and say, well, they don't talk about this either. There's so much of John that is unique to him and he doesn't call the miracles miracles. He calls them signs because he's using them as signposts. Many other miracles and signs Jesus did which aren't recorded in this book he writes in chapter 20, but these are written. In other words, the ones that I have selected, I have written them, John says, so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by by believing, you will have life in his name. John leaves it to John chapter 20 before he reveals his purpose in writing, just in case we've missed it. He comes onto the page and says, by the way, this is what this is about. I've recorded these signs so that you might believe. Come to believe in the true identity of Jesus, but not just as an objective, factual belief. I believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, but that in believing, you might have life in his name. But of course, that's where we started. In him was life. Now we're talking about having life in him, life in his name. What does it mean? What kind of life is this that we have in his name? Well, I'll leave that to you to explore and think about as you read. But notice this purpose. It's to give us signposts. Or in other language, we might say evidence. Because God is not asking anyone to believe without giving a basis for that belief. He's not asking anyone to trust him without having a basis for that trust. And that may surprise some of us because the prevailing view in the contemporary Western world is that faith is the opposite of evidence. You ought to kiss your brain goodbye. 
But God loves and respects us too much to ask us to believe when there is no evidence or even believe against the evidence. Now, John knew that the vast majority of people would be like us. We weren't present when Jesus was here. We didn't witness with our own eyes the amazing things that Jesus did. So what he's done is he's made a very careful selection out of all the things that Jesus did as individual signposts that taken together would help and direct our attention to the true identity of Jesus. So as I finish this morning, let me just concentrate on one. It's a little sign that we read of at the end of John chapter 4, and this is on page 397 of our immersed book, and this is what it says. Once more Jesus visited Canaan Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. There was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied. Your son will live. Literally, your son lives. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time, why was that important, I wonder? Well, you can think about that. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son lives. And so he and his whole household believed. And this is the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. And I think we can all identify with how this royal palace official must have been feeling as any loving father would feel when his son is desperately ill on the point of death, the fear, the helpless anxiety. And at that dark moment, word came to him that Jesus had returned to Cana from Jerusalem. Now he and everybody else knew what had happened at Cana. He knew, therefore, that Jesus was the only person who could save his boy. But what an agonizing decision to leave his son at death's door and travel to Cana, which was 20 miles away, and even on horseback it would take up to five hours to cover that journey. And then, of course, he'd have to find Jesus. And what if he wasn't free to come back with him immediately? And even if he was, then there was the journey back to Capernaum, another five hours, and time was so short. If he left, he risked never seeing his son alive. And to stay with his son, to hold his hand, to comfort him, at least he was doing something. But then realism kicked in that ultimately wasn't going to solve anything. So in his desperation, he left home, went to Cana as fast as he could to find Jesus. And we can just imagine the thoughts that were hammering in his head. What if he couldn't find Jesus? What if Jesus was busy? How would he get him back to Capernaum? Would Jesus be prepared to ride with him? Or would he insist on walking or being carried in some chair the way no, some nobles like to be? And that would take a whole day. And what if his son died and he missed his last moments and the whole thing turned out to be a devastating waste of time? Well, he got to Cana. He found Jesus. 
turned upon finding him. He pleaded with him to come back to, with him to Capernaum to heal his son. And then Jesus said something that obviously completely threw him. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What did he mean? Why was Jesus bringing up such confusing details of theology at a time like this? And so the man said, Lord, ignoring what Jesus had said, come down and heal my son. And Jesus said, go home. Your son lives. This was utterly unexpected. All the man had been able to think about was the fact that he needed physically to find Jesus, to get him, to bring him those 20 miles to Capernaum so Jesus could be with his boy and then there was a chance of being healed. But Jesus was telling him, don't need any of that. I'm not planning to come anyway. Your son lives. I've healed him. It's done. You can just go home. What evidence was there that his boy was healed? Couldn't see him. There's no face time. In the nature of time and space, there was absolutely no way of knowing. No evidence. Just Jesus' word. So what should he do? What would you have done? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Believe what? Believe that I can heal your son? No, he believed that already. That's why he went to Jesus. That wasn't the issue. He would never have left his son behind if he didn't believe that Jesus could heal him. But believe that Jesus had already healed him at a distance when there was absolutely no other evidence for it. The man had a faith problem, as so many of us do. He believed the objective evidence. Jesus had demonstrated his power on many occasions. That's why it had gone to him. But for this there was no additional evidence, nor could they be. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What use would signs and wonders have been? Supposing Jesus had stood there and turned a tree into an elephant. Well, it would have been amazing, although Jesus didn't tend to do that kind of thing. But would that have proved that he had healed his son 20 miles away? He couldn't see. Of course it wouldn't. Signs and wonders wouldn't have helped at all. Jesus had already done signs and wonders. That was sufficient. What the man needed to do was trust not in the power of Christ, but trust in his character. Trust that he meant what he said. Of course, the father could have stayed there and said, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying, and I'm absolutely devastated, and this is just so unexpected. Please, 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 please come down and heal my son. What would have been the point of doing that? Because if his son was already healed, it wasn't going to add anything to it. And if his son wasn't, well, then Jesus was a liar, so why plead with a liar? There's a certain kind of hard rationale going on here. Oh, I'm sure. Well, I can't say I'm sure, but I imagine if it had been me, my emotions would have been all over the place. We can't control our anxieties, can we? Our worries. But perhaps we can learn to control our will. And say, I know how I feel. And it's all upside down. This isn't what I expected. But Jesus has said this. And I trust him. 
It was one o'clock in the afternoon, we learned towards the end of the story. If he had hurried, he could have been home by nightfall. Just remarkably, he didn't. He obviously either stayed with a friend or went to a hotel or something. He waited till the next day, and then he traveled home. And on the way, he was met by a servant who came, and they brought him some evidence. Listen, your son is well. He still couldn't see him. But now he was beginning to add up evidence and the excitement growing. But he asked this question, when did he start to get better? Well, they worked out it was that. Yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon and the man thought, that was when I summoned up enough faith to actually believe Jesus. No. That was when Jesus spoke. And then they got back home. And of course, while they were home, they saw the boy is probably playing with his Lego or his ancient equivalent and having a great time. And the evidence was piling up. It's a story about faith. It's a story about distance. It's a story about learning to trust in the word of Christ. As I finish, the reason I chose this story is because I had massive problems with this issue when I was a teenager. Because like many people in Northern Ireland, I was brought up in a gospel context. My parents not only shared the gospel with me, but more importantly in many ways, they lived it. And I saw it. And so as a child of about 10 or 11, I made a personal response to this. I can remember it vividly. And then I started to grow up. (laughs) And there's things that happen to you. You, you Probably most of you don't remember that now. But things happen to you when you're 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. Some things called hormones, for example happen to you, and all sorts of other changes take place. And then you start to discover what you really like inside. Now, if this doesn't describe anybody here, that's okay. Just shun me on the way out. Uh, I'll just go out this way, and you can all be... You know what I'm talking about. And so the doubts begin to go. And then you're thinking to yourself, if only I could see a sign... Some miracle. And I'll tell you some of the things that I used to think I needed to see. There's no angels dancing on my bed at night. Not that I could see anyway. But if only I could see a sign. And I tortured myself. Not that many people knew that this was going on, but it was going on in the background. Am I really a Christian or not? <laughs> Did I really believe? Well, if I didn't believe, how do I I get, well, what is the right way around to believe? See, my theological vocabulary had increased, along with other things, uh, since I was 10 and 11. So I had, my prayers could be a little bit more impressive to God at the age of 16 than they were when I was 10. So if I didn't believe properly then, well, uh, let let me get it sorted now. So I go through this rigmarole of a whole big long, and I get it sorted, and that lasted three days, and then the whole thing started again. Now, part of this is possibly a reflection on my personality and my makeup. Those of you who know me well will probably say that. But the more I've talked to people, the more common I've discovered this to be. This lack of assurance, this anxiety. And particularly when things go wrong and you discover what your thought life is really like in an unguarded moment. Or you do things that you didn't want to do and didn't intend to do, but you ended up doing and weaknesses surfaced in your personality. And you just can easily become overcome by your own sense of smallness, of unholiness, of inadequacy. And the problem of being in a Christian environment is you're constantly being reminded of how far short you fall. That's the difficulty. Because we're talking about the beautiful Savior and 
where we don't really match up. This story was absolutely central for me. Understanding that the guy could have pleaded and been distressed and given in to his anxiety and it wouldn't have changed a thing. Jesus was not saying to this man, listen, unless you believe 100% the right way round and get everything sorted and live a perfect life, then your boy will be all. But you see, if it's not, then I'll unheal him. This story is a signpost. It literally happened, but John is selected to point us beyond that here is the one who can heal from a distance. It's just as well, because he's not coming back until his return in power and great glory. He can save from a distance. We learn to trust him. In that sense, you have a choice. And it's more complex than this, I understand. But either we give in to the anxiety and allow it to rule at us and spoil our relationship with God, or we trust him. Because this is God we're talking about. And ultimately, as John points out, if you don't believe what Jesus has said, that the one who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, if you don't believe that, you're making God out to be a liar, which is a fairly serious accusation. Learning to trust in the word of God. You see, John's gospel is built around journeys to Jerusalem, geographical journeys, but it raises all kinds of other journeys more important ones, like the journey from anxiety to trust. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word that you've given us in written form. We thank you above that for the word himself who was in the very beginning and yet who became flesh and led his life down for us. Someone whose word can be trusted. Enable us, we pray, to look beyond the anxieties and the emotions that so often are so conflicting and come to the solid rock of your character and know that we can depend on your word eternally. And one day, we will get home like this nobleman, and we'll see with our eyes, and we'll see that it's all true, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he has saved us eternally. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.